Hello, and welcome back to Data Visualization Fundamentals and Best Practices. I'm always tempted to say good morning here, sorry. <laughs> but uh, good morning if it is morning to you, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, whatever it is for you. And I hope you had a good morning or will have a good morning. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, welcome back. <laughs> uh, a few preliminaries before we start uh, today uh, is just I wanted to say about a few things about things that, that I talked about last time and also just how we're changing things a little bit because we had a few more people here than we had expected and so we'll make a few small changes here. So one is that uh, this time we actually posted the the link to the notebook before the class so this is already up there and you should see it in the chat on YouTube as well as on Slack. If you haven't join us on Slack, please do so. We also have the link to that on the YouTube uh, chat right now. So you should be able to click on that. And again, if you have tried before and it didn't work, try it again. We fixed that. Uh, you should be able to sign up. Uh, and we have a, a, a Slack channel there for discussion and for questions. And speaking of questions, please keep asking questions. We got a lot more last time than we had expected. Uh, and I was waiting until the end to answer them, which wasn't the best way to do this, I think. So today what we'll do is I'll pause a few times and then answer questions sort of more as they happen so that they make more sense in context rather than half an hour later when when it's just hard to remember what I even talked about uh, at the beginning uh, of, of this little lecture. And uh, also, I should say that we have we have three people behind the scenes uh, here today: uh, Wayne, Paul, and Allison, who are going to be answering questions as well and and posting pointers. So I just wanted to give them a quick shout out here uh, because we had more more people were more were chattier than we had expected, which is a good thing. I'm I'm all for asking questions and discussion here. And if you want to argue about things, I'm happy to do that. Maybe not on the live stream, <laughs> but we can do that on Slack uh, as well. I think that covers all the preliminaries I wanted to, to cover. And I said I will, I will try to keep more of a, an eye on the, on the chat today and, and try to, to monitor that a bit more so I can, I can be a bit more responsive to, to questions. All right, so what I want to talk, to, talk about today is data mappings and how, how data and visualization relate and how we actually get from the data to a data visualization. So this is here again, our friend, the scatterplot. And I just want to use this as a way to, to discuss sort of the, the components of a chart. So in a chart like this, well, I guess you can see it, uh, we have uh, the, so this is a scatterplot again. The scatterplot shows data, in this case, about car models. This is an old data set from the 70s that's just fairly commonly used in statistics. And what, what it shows, what it, what it contains, is about 400 different car models. And for each of them, it has the name. It has the, the, the how strong the engine is, so the power, the horsepower here, which is now shown on the horizontal axis here and the economy, the miles per gallon uh, on the vertical axis in this case, on this kettle plot. But more importantly, what I want to talk about here is more the components of the chart. So what you see here are, of course, well, there are some, some axes and some labels. So these are the axes here that have these tick marks that tell you what the numbers are. Because part of the idea is, of course, that you should be able to read at least roughly what the values are. I said this last time that I don't think charts are really meant to be used for, for high precision. So the idea is not so much that you're able to read exactly what the numbers are on any of these here, but the point is just to get the sense of what the values are roughly. So there are almost always uh, some kind of axis annotations or labels along the way. And as well as axis uh, descriptions here, but basically that just tell us what this is. So that's why this tells us that this is economy miles per gallon, uh, and this is power here in horsepower. But more importantly, what I want to talk about is the parts that that make up the actual chart, and these things are called marks. So there, this is a term that's that I think goes back to Jacques Bertin. I'm not sure if that's actually his term, but the but the marks are what make up a chart, and they can be 
lots of different things and you will see a bunch of different things. But here they are circles. They could be rectangles. They could be bars. They could be all kinds of different shapes. They could be uh, wedges in a pie chart uh, so or shapes of countries on a map, perhaps. So you could have lots of different kinds of, of, of marks, but we'll, we'll get to this in a little bit. And what we and and how they are drawn is what is called a retinal variable, retina from the retina in your eyes. So it's called ret a retinal variable that is the 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 value, the visual representation or the visual manifestation of the data. So in this case, these circles all have the same color. They all have the same size. So these aren't retinal variables because they don't change. They're all the same, but what is a retinal variable in this case is position. So the, the location along these two axes is what we mapped here in this particular chart. And that's what makes a scatter plot. A scatter plot is really a chart that maps essentially these two axes. It can be more, and I'll show you this in a second, but that is what the scatter plot uh, is all about. So these the, the, the marks here are the circles. They could be dots, they could be filled, they could be different shapes, but those are the marks, and then the retinal variable is what is being represented uh, and mapped to from the data. So let's build this. So I, I didn't talk about the, the the intricacies of plot last time, but I want to show you how plot works today. So we're using. So, so okay, maybe I should start by. Uh, one step further here, or earlier here. So on Observable, the programming language we use is JavaScript. JavaScript is has nothing to do with Java. If you're familiar with Java, it's not. It's just it, it's an unfortunate historical accident that it's, it was called that, because back when JavaScript started, it Java was all the rage. So <laughs> they were trying kind of trying to get on that train, but it really is a totally different. Uh, language, but it does look a lot like any kind of C-derived language. So if you've seen C before or Python or many of these languages, they all kind of look the same. But the the way they work can be quite different. And that is actually, especially in comparison with Java, the it can be really confusing because JavaScript really is nothing like Java. <laughs> it's not really object oriented. It's much more of a functional language. So it's so so don't just just pretend it's called ECMAScript, which is its official name as a standardized language. But that is the language that we're using here, and uh, it's you know it's just another language. Uh, <laughs> so I can do things like I can just well if I can actually type correctly here, I can do things like I can I can do simple math and I can do uh, variable assignments perhaps uh, and things like that. And so, and also what I should also mention here because I could just keep doing this without mentioning it is that whenever I type something into observable, like let's make it something else so we can actually see the data difference. To make it, to, to have observable actually run this cell as I'm typing in it, I can hit shift return and I just do this sort of automatically as I go along, but you will see that uh, and I will mention it a few times, but I just want to make sure that 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 you're aware of that. So we're using JavaScript and we're using a a specific JavaScript library called plot. And in JavaScript, this is essentially an uh, a global object. So it's called plot uppercase p. And I can I'm gonna call a function called plot. So it's plot dot plot, <laughs> and then we'll pass something into that. Uh, and that that is how you how you run plot. There are other ways, but this is how we're going to do it. And um, the and the uh, um, sorry, I just looked at the chat and now I'm confused by what I was going to say. So the uh, so plot can be can be called in different ways. And but but we're going to just stick with this particular way of doing things because you can just basically put everything you need into one call. Oh, I should also mention if you're familiar with D three. D3 is also very different from plot. So plot is, is, is a much more efficient way of doing things. It certainly isn't nearly as flexible as D3, but but you will see that it can do a lot of things. And it's it's much more um, it's more structured around a grammar of graphics, which I will mention, I will talk about in a second as well, what that means. All right, so so again, plot is this object, and we're calling a function on it. So it's just plot.plot plot to call a function. And here I've 
I've put in these curly braces, which basically just create an object. So this means an, so an object is, um, let me just briefly show that perhaps. So if I have a data set like uh, Olympian, uh, no, JavaScript here first, and then let's grab our Olympians data set again, which we looked at last time, I think, or maybe it was, let's, let's do cars, because that was just the one that I used in the scatter plot here. So the cars data set, these, these are built in variables. And the a data set that I talked about this last time that we, we, we think of this as a table, but really what it is, is an array or a list, which is kind of the same thing in JavaScript. So an array is basically just a collection of things, a, an ordered collection of things. Uh, they are in sequence here. And then within each of these is an object and the object is has these properties. So uh, the, the properties are all names and values. So the name of this first property is name. Uh, this one is called economy, miles per gallon. This one is called cylinders and so on. And the values are, the, are basically the, the things that are after the colon. So name, colon, and then this string here means that the name property has this value. And the cylinders property has this value. Right, so these are this is how we uh, how an object works, and and an object, and you can construct an object the same way essentially it's, as it's done here. So you see these curly braces here. Curly braces mean an object, which means within the object we have properties that have names and values, and an array is something that essentially has square brackets around it and then commas between the objects uh, between yeah between the the items, which can be objects or other things. I hope I haven't over-explained this here, but it's essentially just a simple, uh, you know, it's, it's, it works the same way as, I think in Python it works exactly the same. Uh, many other languages look essentially exactly the same. Plot. <laughs> so here we have a plot uh, call, and we, can, we pass in this object. And so this is basically just, you can, you, can, you can essentially ignore this whole part around it because the interesting part happens within those lines. So that's why, if you just hit return here, then it just essentially gets out of the way. And so now we, we have to specify what we want to show. This is why I talked about marks earlier, because we have to specify the marks. So what are the marks that go into this? And maybe a little bit slower here. So marks is a property of the object. It's called marks, that is its name. And it, it gets an array. So I will give it an array of objects or a list of, of, of things in here. And so that, that, is, that is represented by these square brackets. And so now, uh, if I'm doing this correctly, and I should probably look at my cheat sheet here to make sure that I'm following what I was trying to do. Yep. And I will, once I'm, I'm done with this part, I will, I will pause and, and start answering questions because I think there are already some, <laughs> are a few questions about this. So now in, inside of this plot call, I can specify marks. And the marks in are specified again as function calls. So the plot object, and you can see this as I type plot and then dot, you can see that this is drop down menu and I can start looking at what, what are all the things that are here. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff here that you can call. And I'll just call plot dot dot <laughs> just because. Uh, it's fun to say. And I can now pass in uh, what I want to be plotted here. And the first thing that I need is I need to give it data. So uh, I'm going to use the cars data set here, and that is what I'm going to, to plot. But how do I do that? And uh, to, the how is specified as another object within the, the plot dot dot <laughs> call. So here I can I specify the mapping. So these are now the retinal variables that I specify. For x here, it's going to be, what are we going to do for this power? And I have to hopefully get this right here by, by spelling out the name of the column or of the, uh, of the property on, in the object. And so what I'm doing here is that I am mapping the power, the horsepowers to x, to the horizontal axis, and the economy, the mass per gallon, to the vertical axis. And we'll see if I got this right. Yeah, actually, I did. Uh, so now we have a scatter plot. 
And so you can see that this con simply consists of these dots that have been mapped as power on the horizontal axis, economy on the vertical axis, and we're using this cars data set. So what plot now does is it goes through all these values that are in the cars data. So everything that is in this array, it'll go through every single object, pull out the things that I specified, which are the economy and the horsepowers here, and use those numbers to draw my scatter plot. And I did that by specifying this as one of the marks. And I can add marks. I could, I could do additional things here as well. All right, and I think I should probably start answering some of these questions. Um, so one, one question that I, I figured would, would come up, so this is a good one that I, I should have mentioned, is the plot library is available, so is the plot library available to use with JavaScript outside of Observable? Yes, uh, it's an open source library. You can use it anywhere you want. It's certainly easiest on, on Observable, as you will see, because I can make changes very quickly. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a general JavaScript library. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question here, but no comma between key value pairs in the object. Yes, you, you put commas there. So maybe this was just as I was typing. But in the maybe you didn't see it in the, uh, in, in the example of me opening up that that object or these, these arrays, because it just omits the commas. But as you see uh, in, and this is actually important syntax, <laughs> it's very important. If you leave something out here, it will complain. So we get, we're going to get uh, just a JavaScript error. So yes, the, there are commas between um, the, uh, between uh, the, the, the uh, properties of the, of the, of the object. This is a good question here. I'm noticing some similar naming conventions between observable plot and Vega Lite. A lot of these libraries, Vega Lite in particular, and plot, have a sort of a common ancestry, which is this idea of a grammar of graphics. And so the that's how I, what I was talking earlier about terminology and marks and so on. So this is all terminology that goes back to uh, certainly goes back to Lee Wilkinson's book, The Grammar of Graphics, but also Jacques Bertin, who wrote this book about semiology of graphics in the 60s. So these, this is where a lot of this terminology uh, is coming from. Yes, uh, also retinal variables are called visual encodings. Yes, I should maybe call it that, yes. So the, the this is the more sort of like academic term is like retinal variables, but yeah, the visual encodings is the same thing, absolutely. Um, oh, actually, so this is a bit more of an in, uh, in-depth question that I, I picked by mistake. Sorry here, Harash. <laughs> but uh, this would be this would take a bit longer. I think there are certain similarities between them, but I, I don't think I want to go into the details because I don't actually know Jupyter notebooks enough to really do that. Um, all right, T two more maybe. Uh, so this one here. Why do marks take an array and not an object? That's a good question, and that is because you can have multiple marks. So. Um, mm, this is probably not the best idea to do, but let me just try to find something here real quick that I uh, I prepared for last time and then didn't show, uh, which is that I can add something here that is a different mark. So I can basically add as many marks as I want. Actually, you already saw this last time, um, but I think I had it here, did I not? Sorry, I'm just looking at my my notebook from last time. Yes, here it is. I just want to make make this very quick. But I could add a regression line here, for example. So, and so, and 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 what you can do with the marks is you can just add and layer more and more as you if if you want. So you can just add more marks that that and 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 that's an array because it's just a list of things you want to add. They're all they can be all be different, which I think is this makes the the, the regression line here a good example because it really is uh, a totally different thing that you can add. So it's not it's 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 simply a um, sorry, I'm hiding what I'm doing down there, but but don't get scared by by all this stuff down there. It's just basically adding another mark that that computes a bunch of values for you, but it adds this regression um, uh, line here. And then there's a question here about the differences between vanilla JavaScript and observable. I don't want to go into that. That's that's a long list of things. We we have we have a video about that, and we also have materials 
uh, the, there's an introduction to observable series that talks about this as well. Uh, and then final one here that I'm going to talk about is uh, between the, the double quotes and the single quotes, there is, there's practically no difference. I don't think JavaScript cares. Uh, other languages care more about it. These tick marks, whether the double normal double quotes or single quotes, I, I don't think it matters. Uh, I tend to, actually in this case, I, I use double quotes. I very often use single quotes, uh, It's but it's not like in C where there is a very strict distinction between the two. Uh, and one is, you know, one is a character, one is a string. So it's a much more, uh, JavaScript is much more laissez-faire about uh, types and stuff. All right, so, but let me get back a little bit into my, into what I actually wanted to talk about, uh, which is encodings. Yeah, so encodings, again, thank you for, for talking about that because um, that's exactly what, what they are. So I can add more encodings here because um, I can build, I can, I can make this, I, I can use the same marks and just show, I'm sorry, I need to rearrange my windows here. There you go. So I can add things here. For example, I can, I could change the, the I mean, rerun this. So now we're removing the regression line again. I could now do something like, for example, I could fill them all. Well, I could just fill them all with the same color. And that's not really an encoding. I just changed it to make it look nicer. Actually, I'm going to, a little bit smaller here so we can see it and but i can also and so this is now so basically a constant so the, the color here is is a constant num number or a constant value but i could also use the number of cylinders as my encoding and so now we have a difference because now the, the the number of cylinders impacts the color or it determines the colors that are being shown and now what's interesting about this is that the, and actually, let's, let me just stick with this for a second and map something else. So let's also map the weight here to the radius, which I'm misspelling. So there's now nothing here. OK. And so now we can see a small difference in these uh, in the lines. But because the values are so large, you don't actually see a huge difference. But you can see a little bit that these circles here are smaller than these ones. And finally, I will. I will add a little title here, which is not, it's kind of not technically an encoding because what it does is simply adding a, a tooltip, but it's not shown all the time. You could show it all the time. You could add labels. I just want to clutter up this chart. So, so now we have, instead of two variables being encoded, we have four. We have the two on the, on the position, and then we have color and size. And you could add more. In general, it's not a good idea to add too many. This is actually probably already too many. Like, and especially because the color, I'm sorry, the size isn't very visible here. It doesn't matter that much. But you probably don't want to, to overdo the number of encoding or the number of, of variables that you map to visual variables, uh, because it's just impossible to read them all. And it's and it's it's a very common thing that people want to just go, go overboard and go like, well, there's all this stuff you could do. You could have color and size and shape and this and that. And it just it just ends up with, with a totally uh, unreadable chart. The thing that happened here, and I want to talk about this in a little bit, but I'm I'm hoping I'm, I, I can talk about this <laughs> and not run over, uh, is to talk about the fact that the 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 way these number or the values work here, or the variables, sorry, the, the the data values work. So I've mapped cylinders to color, and what happens here is that that observe that that plot looks at the 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 domain of the cylinders column, and and sees numbers there, and so it thinks that this is a numerical variable, a numerical column that is probably continuous because it doesn't know that cylinders aren't aren't really, uh, you know, aren't continuous that you can't have like 4.7 and 8.3 uh, cylinders. So what I'm gonna look, show you here is that I can add more things here to this definition. So we are now outside of the marks array and yeah, we're adding a comma here. This is very important because again, JavaScript will yell at you if you, if you leave out that comma and we're specifying a new property here. This is called color. And so here we put stuff that has to do with color. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to specify that I want a color legend. And so if I say legend true here, that will add a legend at the top here. And so this shows me 
what the colors are or like what 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 the color what the values are mapped to in colors and you can see that this is continuous <laughs> so we have this little rainbow here and because we only see a few of those values it looks like this is categorical color i'll talk a bit more about the differences between continuous and categorical color at some point but uh, because we only have a few values we only get these few values of course in in color that that represent those values but i don't want that I want this to be a different color scheme and a different way of looking at color. So what I can do is I can specify the domain here. And so this is another thing I can just add to this. And again, not forget the comma afterwards. And I'm just going to put these numbers in here. There are other ways to do this, but I'm, I'm just going to keep this simple. So I'm, I know that there is three, four, six, and eight. And so now we have a different legend. So now this tells me that these are distinct categories because I have specified them to be individual values. And now I get these four different colors that are, um, well, that are distinct, but also individually mapped to these numbers. Because the way I look at cylinders is that they, they are a category of car. They're not a continuous range from, again, from like 0.7 to 6.9 or whatever. So, so this, is, this is something you can do. Uh, in plot, but also just important to think about as you're creating charts. And I'm going to look over here because I see there are more, more start questions. Yeah, so there are a number of good suggestions here that I'm all not going to do right now because I want to keep this simpler. We could add a range slider. We could add, I don't know if we have a, a legend for the radius. Um, and I will not talk about how to plot the frequency because uh, I will talk about uh, transformations later. So today I'm just going to talk about how to map values we have, but there will be, I think it's next, it's definitely next week, but I forget if it's Tuesday or Thursday when I talk about transformations. And actually I will do, if I get to it today, there's one example I have with transformations, but I want to actually keep that uh, to a later uh, part. Right, so this is actually a good question here. Um, any suggestions for showing where there is more than one record with the same X and Y value? And in fact, I actually think that, oh, not in this case, yeah, this one doesn't have that much overplotting. So this is a common problem in uh, in scatter plots when you have a lot of data, is that the, the dots all get plotted all over each other. And so what people do, and that's why the, the default chart here uses circles rather than, uh, rather than filled circles <laughs> is I think if I just change this to stroke, so now I have empty circles and that way I can see a little bit more clearly when there's overplotting. So I can see how many there are or if there's one hiding behind the others, perhaps like here, you can see that there is one of these cyan ones behind an orange one. So, oh, and I, sorry, I need to take off the question so you can actually see what I was doing. So down here, what I changed, um, is I changed this here, this was fill before, and now I changed it to stroke. And what it does is it, it because there's no fill defined, it just keeps the, the circle empty and just uses the stroke color on the outline of the, of the circle. And yes, there's a good question here about creating a domain programmatically. You can absolutely do that. Do that. Uh, I, I don't think I want to go in very deeply into JavaScript, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna not show you this right now. Uh, but push on here a little bit uh, to get to uh, a few other kinds of things you can do with mappings. So our uh, this this plot again, this is just the scatter plot, and the scatter plot again is very useful, but uh, but it's also in in a sense the simplest chart that that exists. So in um, so we can we can do something different here, and I'll I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my my cheat sheet here. So what we can do here is we can we can also look at a domain, a vertical axis that isn't uh, categorical. I'm oh, sorry, that isn't continuous. So I have a different. I hope I have. I don't have. Where is my car makes? Um, let me just grab this real quick here from <laughs> from my I don't know book. Uh, car makes, I should have that. 
Copy import. Well, this actually gives me a chance to show you another feature of observable and the nice things that you can do with JavaScript is that I can import a data set from a different notebook. I didn't mean to show this here, but I will now. So here I'm going to, I, I copied a uh, an import statement from my other notebook. This is the official one. <laughs> and I have this, this variable called car makes. And this just basically took, I, I just wrote a little function that, that, that takes the cars data and just puts an additional uh, column into it, which is, and I can show you that here. I think I should be able to actually show you this using this one here. Yep. So this is our fancy uh, data table cell and, and my face is in the way, but um, <laughs> What you can see here is the same same columns as before, but I have added the make here. So this is the brand of car that 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 the car is made by, or that the, that the car is sold under. And so I could now go and and, and change the vertical axis here, the vertical mapping to my make, and that gives me a very different chart. And this is a little bit too much, so I'm going to just, actually, I'm going to zoom out here a little bit. But this is a another very different, but also potentially very useful chart. This is called a dot plot. So we've just gone from a scatter plot, which has two continuous axes, to a dot plot, which has one categorical axis, which is the, the make. And categorical is basically means that you have a small or at least a countable number of values. So the number of um, of brands is countable and is relatively small. And so this is now that th there's no reason to like plot this. That, that, that and there's nothing in between them, right? So there is uh, with brands especially, brands exist as, as distinct entities, and there is no there's there's no um, value in between AMC and Audi or Audi and BMW. You can't interpolate between them and say, well, what's halfway between Audi and BMW? That's not a meaningful thing to, to, to look at. And so that's why this is now a categorical axis, which 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 breaks up this the vertical space into these sort of lanes. And each lane now shows the the cars on here. And in my example, and this I'm just going to copy over here, is a, a little sort that I put in there. And I might also just change the... Uh... Just back to being a fill. Maybe limit this to just like, let's just go... Doesn't values here so so this now shows me the sort of the the, the most um the cars that have or the, the 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 car makers the car makes that have the highest ho horsepower cars because I, we're, we're sorting the values here and i'm limiting the top and we're, we're sorting top down and i'm limiting this to just just some number of like 12 in this case and what you can see here is kind of interesting because you can see there are these groups of cars. So like Pontiac, and this data set, again, I think you mentioned this is from the 70s. So this is all very old information. But it's kind of interesting to see sort of like uh, model ranges because you can see that they have these two here at the top that have the highest horsepower. And then there's this sort of medium range here, uh, which is still kind of high, 160 horsepower. But then they have these lower ranges here. And also because we've mapped color or we've mapped the cylinders to color, you can see that they're distinct numbers of cylinders. So they had these three or these four cylinder cars here. There are a few three cylinder cars in this case, in this data set. Four cylinders here for the low end, and then it's six cylinders and eight cylinders for, for the, the, the higher end here. And so you can, you can see kind of a, a lot of information about the sort of like the makeup of these car brands. You can also see, for example, that uh, Pontiac versus Chevy, Chevy had a lot, a lot uh, more cars that were smaller because we're still mapping uh, weight to the radius. They were, or well, they weren't necessarily small, but they were lighter <laughs> and had lower uh, lower horsepower uh, than Pontiac, for example. So 
Okay, and then since, okay, I'm just again looking at the chat here. This is a good question. How many, uh, is there a research about how many visual encodings is too many? This is a difficult question. I don't think there is a specific um, number, but but it it I would I would usually say that you don't want to map more than three, maybe four things. It depends a lot on what you're what you're trying to do. Sometimes it can be okay to map several things, but you really want to keep things simple. And there's also a distinction that I was going to talk about today, but I knew I wasn't going to get to this. <laughs> I'll push this to next next time. Is to talk about the difference between exploration and presentation and in exploration you can map more and then you might see things like i was just pointing out here like the color the the sizes the size and the weight here being lower here and higher here but you might not want to show that because it's just a bit too much you might want to make a separate plot that just shows that oh yeah and then so this question just came in here that it seems like there are no blue, blue color dots and that's because the um, because I, I cut this off here, and so there are no three cylinder cars. But if I don't limit this, then we will see. So Master supposedly made these cars here that had three cylinders. So you can see these blue dots. Honestly, I don't. I've never seen a three cylinder car, and I don't know why a three cylinder would have more horsepower than a four cylinder. So. I don't know. There are a few mistakes in this data set. We, we this this is this, we, we took this from somewhere else, and we and I know that there are some misspellings in here. So I, I it's possible that that this is not actually correct. Uh, that maybe um, so so uh, the reason the cars may have existed or not. I'm not entirely sure. Another car guy. I don't know. And then okay, last question. But then I really have to move on here. Is how do you make, did I get the, the the tables, the summary statistics? Yes. And that's actually this is a good question because somebody also asked me last time why I wasn't using that kind of table when I was showing the 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 data table. So I was using this one. This is the JavaScript table. This is the so the the old table we have in Observable, but the fancy new one is this one. This is the data table cell. And so when you go and make a new a new table, a new cell, I should say, there's, and you type in table, so the search here, you can just type, start typing and you search, and they are, um, and then the data table is the one that is the one you really want for most cases. And then here, this lets you pick any value, any variable that is a list, you can also talk to databases that way. I will, I, I should show this at some point to how, how to directly get data from a database. But you can have databases, you can have car makes here. I, I have a data set in, at, import here that I was going to show, and maybe we'll get to that, which is about laser strike incidents. And so what this does is it shows you the values. So you can scroll through the values, you can scroll, scroll through the columns, and I should move this so that my face isn't covering up too much of it. And and then you get these summary statistics, and those show you. Oopsie, no, oh no, what did I do? Um, here we are. So back to my table because I was scrolling a bit too far, and it was thinking that I wanted to to do a back command here. So the what this gives me also is is these this very useful histogram essentially here that show me the values. So. Uh, in this case, these are, these are like the, the distribution of the of the years in the date, uh, the values for the airports. There are a bit too many here to really show meaningfully what kinds of laser was used. So there are most of them were green apparently, and then there's um, blue and white, and so on. And so you get a lot of useful information from that. And and I I'm, I don't actually want to show this right now, but <laughs> you can filter, you can sort. Do all kinds of things. So this is this is a very powerful thing to use. And the reason I wasn't using this last time is because when I pick the the variable here, it doesn't show me built-in variables because they are loaded only on demand. So they're not being shown in this list. So for built-in variables like the cars data set, which is just you know for demonstration purposes, uh, it it was just not the useful thing to use. Okay, moving on. Uh, so apparently there are three cylinder cars. Uh, and oh, and three-cylinder engines, I guess, are used now for hybrids because they are there. You don't. Uh, it's it's it, yeah. Anyway, they maybe they're more efficient. I don't know. Right. 
So let me figure out what my next step was here. So very quickly, I want to just show you, I have a few more examples in the write-up. So the write-up is linked from both the Slack channel and from the, uh, uh, and from the chat here, but also uh, you can see, you can find it if you just go to the, to the notebook that, that you were on last time and you, and you open up the collection, it'll show as one of the items on the left. Let me just show you one thing here real quick. I just want to replace the, the dot mark here with something else, just to show you that you can change, use different marks. So plot dot dot. So the dot here is the mark. It's a dot. And I'm going to change this to a tick. And tick X is the vertical uh, mark, or the vertical tick. Uh, tick Y would be uh, horizontal. And it's, it's named that because tick X needs an X value. So it... It basically shows that same data, but this time now uh, as vertical lines. And so this is just to show you that you can use different ways, different things to represent your data. So let me talk about data real quick then. So I, I, I mentioned, and so this is in the write-up a little bit further down, I talk about the... Um, Actually, no. Let's do the line chart real quick, and then and then I will talk about data types. So a, a line, in in some ways, works very similarly to uh, to a scatter plot, with the the, the diff difference. I'm just going to grab the built-in line chart example here. The difference being that the going to zoom in here. Yeah. So the line chart is is essentially specified exactly the same as the as what we just did earlier. So we call plot dot plot, and we pass in an array of marks. So the marks property in the in the object that we pass in has an array, and ignore this for the moment. <laughs> and all we need is to give it a line. In this case, this is a line y mark, but I think it doesn't actually matter in this case because it just it just draws the lines in order. Uh, and, and the order is, is left to right here. But uh, the line mark then needs a data set. So this is the, the Apple uh, ticker symbol. That's what the name of the variable is as well. So this is just, this is just stock prices for Apple uh, over a few years. And then we have the two mappings here. So we map the date to the horizontal axis and the, the closing price to the vertical axis. And so this is very similar to the scatter plot. We have two continuous axes, but there's one big difference. And that difference is that for every date, we only have one value. If we had multiple values, we couldn't draw a line chart because then the lines would keep, well, there would be lots of vertical lines basically because you would have multiple values vertically that would have to be connected. And so what plot then does is it draws lines between those points. And uh, what you saw me just remove there earlier is this line at zero? So this you can also, because as just like you can you can pass in a data set, you can just pass in an array. So this is an array here, as because it uses these square brackets, and it just consists of a single value. So it's just the value zero, but the, but the rule why uh, is is it's just a horizontal line that expects an array, and you could have multiples. Like I could have I don't know. Let's put in. At 100, for example, so you could put in like uh, a, a grid of values here, but in this case, there's just one at zero, and the reason that for that being there is it forces plot to to include zero in the chart in the vertical uh, domain, because otherwise, what it would do is would just look at the data. So I'm commenting this out here. If I just if I take it out, then the then then plot just basically goes well. What are the values that I need to plot? And it only shows the 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 those that are actually there, and so then we don't start at zero. And it in for a line chart, this doesn't matter all that much. For uh, in in general, <laughs> for a bar chart, it still always starts at zero, even if you don't do that. But this is just a common thing to make to, to force uh, the the domain to include the zero. There are other ways of doing that uh, as well. To show you a slightly more interesting one, I think this is, oh yeah, this is actually also built in. Well, let me show you that uh, as well. Of course, we can do this 
with multiple uh, lines as well. So we have an example of that also built in. Multi-series line chart. This is a plot of unemployment data by industry. So this is these are 2000 to 2010. Uh, we, we we plot the uh, the date on again on the on the horizontal axis, the unemployment number on the vertical axis, and then we break it up by industry. The reason the C is here is because we want to break it up into more values. This is basically just a uh, a plot internal thing that we need here. We could also use, and this is actually probably the better way to do this in this particular case, is to color them. So here I have a different color for each industry, and I'm also gonna put a title on there that again pulls from that same column. And so now I can hover over these and see what they are. Or I could add a, a, a legend here as well. So this is this is line charts. And the reason I talk about line charts is because I, I want to show you something that that is important as a distinction. And so this is where I want to talk about data types. And again, sorry, I just looked at the chat real quick to see if there's something that I need to cover here. I don't want to to talk about like more advanced things here right now uh, and st still stick to my uh, fairly simple examples here, but just to illustrate a few things about, um, about how data works. So one important distinction, and I, I talked about this briefly last time, and it's a bit, there's a bit more of that in the, uh, in the write-up, is the distinction between different types of data. So I showed this bar chart of letter frequencies. And, the, and the, the bar chart is, again, if we ignore this part here, which we don't actually need in this case, the, the, the bar chart, again, calls plot.plot. .plot. We have an array of marks. And the marks, in this case, are called bars. Uh, this is bar-wise, so that means that this is a vertical bar. We have a data set of the, the letters of the alphabet. And each of them has a column for the letter and a column for the frequency. and because these, and, and so as I was talking about earlier with the brands, there is nothing in between Buick and, and Honda. There's no, like, there's no, no uh, inherent you know, thing that, that, that lives in between those. And there's nothing between uh, A and B or, or C and D or, or, I don't know, G and H to, to kind of move away from like letter grades. If you're used to letter grades, uh, you might think that there's like an A plus or a B minus or whatever. No, forget that. So th <laughs> there's nothing in between those letters. And, uh, and so I can, I can uh, these are just names, right? So they're names of, of, of a concept in this case, a letter. And so I can, I can treat them as being entirely unsorted. Of course, the alphabet has an inherent ordering, but it's not like, uh, like letter grades. Letter grades have an inherent uh, ordering that that is that is important because it 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 makes a difference whether you go from one to two or sorry from A to B as a letter grade. But in in the alphabet as as a collection of letters, it makes no difference. Actually, maybe the alphabet is a bad example in this case. But if you think of it uh, as car brands again, car brands don't have an inherent ordering. You can sort them by their by the name, so it's alphabetical, or by the number of cars they sell, or by, I don't know, by profits, or by something else, but the number of employees, perhaps. So there are lots of ways you can sort car brands, or car manufacturers, I should say, perhaps, but the but, but there's no inherent order to car brands. They are just names of entities. And the same is true for these letters. So what that allows me to do is I can just sort them however I want. I can just sort them by frequency in this case, or I could sort my car manufacturers by, by number of cars. And, but, but it's important that, to know that you can only do that with plots, with charts that have independent objects. And what I see a fair amount, more than, than, I, than I would ever hope to see, <laughs> is people doing this wrong. And uh, so because you can always change this, you can always go and say, well, let's just make this a line chart. And let's see if I can make this happen real quick here. Because there's a little bit of, I think I can just make this a line, we'll see. So if I, if I say line here, 
So I, I get a line chart that represents the same data. It shows the same numbers, and it's it's technically nothing different, right? We, we're still showing our letters on the x-axis, our frequencies on the y-axis, but now we're pretending that there is something in between them, so that there is some 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 continuum between these letters, because the lines, as they connect, they make these uh, these continuous gradients. But but those are totally meaningless. And I hope to show you this with by just re reordering this, because they are letters. I can change this, and I will do that real quick here by just copying some code and not. Um, not kind of going to try and explain it in detail, but what I've done here is I've resorted this chart by and and sorted that in uh, in alphabetical order now. And now you can see that it's totally different, right? So this is now a to totally different chart, and that is because and and the lines now look like this is like really jagged, like there's lots of differences here on um, uh, between these 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 letters. But that's again is not meaningful. So this is not a meaningful chart. <laughs> this is a bad example. Bad example. And, and somebody asked me about radar charts last time. This is one of the reasons why radar charts are a problem, because you have all these different axes and their order that, that you can change however you want changes the shape of the shape that you get from, or the, the, the shape of the outline that you get from drawing uh, that plot. And so the same thing is true here. So don't, don't use line charts. This is a really bad example. But I wanted to show this because it illustrates the idea of categorical versus continuous data. I hope. There is a different uh, approach to this, perhaps, which is that when you go from continuous values to, to, to aggregated data, you might want to do this. So here I have a chart. And actually, I could have just used, I guess, the, the uh, this table here. But um, so this chart here shows this laser strikes data that I just used in the in the data table. So I have this table of laser strikes, which we have down here. Uh, no, this is the cars. Somewhere down here, I have my, there we go. So we ha here we have the this data about laser strikes over four years, I think. And uh, each of these records has, and there are like several, yeah, there's like 35,000 records here. So I can, when I do an aggregation, which I'm doing here, uh, in this example here, and I don't want to ex try to explain the aggregation here, but let's just say that this is essentially defining, this is just counting the, the number of, of, of rows and then using that as the vertical value. And then the, the X value is the year. Uh, and then we just fill it, fill it with a steel blue just to make it look nicer. So now I've gone from a uh, so so these are individual dates and actually times too. So there is a date and a time of day in this data set. So you have essentially very high resolution of values. So you could draw the whole data set essentially as a continuous line chart if you wanted to. But in this case, because I'm aggregating from thirty five thousand records and um, so this is five years, so so uh, almost two thousand days to just five bars, I'm, I'm looking at a, a, a very large step back. So it makes more sense to me to, to treat these years as individual steps. And that's why I think bar charts are a better idea here. But there is no strict rule why this has to be like that. So I should be able to change this to a line chart. Um, oh, but they're not sorted the way I was expecting them to. So uh, <laughs> let's just ignore this for a moment uh, and Oh, it's because of the fill, I guess. Let me uh, no. Let's do the line here and remove the fill. Yeah, okay, there we go. So that's my line chart. Uh, so in, in this case now, I have a line chart doing the same thing. Um, but this, again, because uh, observable well, plot, uh, in this case, doesn't know that these are years and they're distinct. It also thinks that there are like half years in between. So now I have a line chart, but let's, let's ignore this for the moment. I have a line chart here. And that is, that is 
that is technically the correct way to show this as well. But I think it makes more sense to use bars here because these are individual uh, highly aggregated values per year. And the year is a, is a large, um, you know, a large chunk of time. So it makes it makes sense to, cut, to treat this as separate. But but I'm just trying to show here that the distinction isn't that obvious always. And uh, the, the categorical versus continuous data distinction is can, can change, and it can be um, and can be um, context dependent. It might depend on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to show, or how you look at the data, which can be can be different. Right. So. Okay, so this is a good question here. There are lots of good questions actually <laughs> that are being flagged. So I, I, uh, I'm just going to look at this one here. Is there a way to plot a computed variable that isn't a column in the data set like power over weight? Yes. And actually, let me show this very quickly. I didn't want to go very deeply into JavaScript, but this is an easy one to demonstrate something here. Power over weight. Let's just actually do this with this chart here. There you go. So my scatter plot here, I could now I, I can so each of these mappings, the way they they work in plot, is this is basically a shortcut here. If I put in a string here, then plot is going to look up the the column or the property with that value in my data set and and use that. But what's really happening is that a function has to go through all the verb all the objects and pick that value out. And so what I can do here is um, let's do power over weight. Uh, so what what happens is essentially that that a function is created, and and so this is the syntax for creating a what's called an arrow function. That that um, let's just do it. This what was this called again? Sorry, I'm gonna try and not mess up the the string too much. So I'm gonna copy this. This is going to create the exact same chart here. What, I'm, what I've done here is this syntax here, this, this arrow, creates what's called an, an anonymous function. So this creates a function. In, in, in Python, this would be called a, lam, a lambda. Uh, so this, this creates a function here that's, uh, that gets a, an argument that I call d here, d for data. And it returns this what, the, the result of this expression here. So this is just basically taking uh, this is using the um, array syntax to access this because there's a space in the name. So that's why I'm using this. So it, it pulls out the power HP property from the object. And what plot does, because it, it gets a function rather than a name or a string, is it goes through and applies that function to every single object. So now I get, so this is getting called now here. And so what I could do now is I could now put something in here that's a bit more complicated. Like I could say, let's make this a little calculation and go with um, the um, power divided by weight. And so let's see if this works. There we go. So now we are computing a value, a variable, every time we plot this. So the variable here, uh, or the, the new value, is the is the, the power value that I'm pulling out of the object divided by the, the weight of the object. And so of course, this is a good question because this is, this is something that you actually want to do very often is you, you want to, to show different things and you can just do this essentially in line uh, here. Okay, we've got time for me one quick question. There are a lot of good ones that I can... Yes, yeah, so there's a question here about formatting the labels. You can, of course, uh, do better, a better job formatting. Um, that's uh, I don't I'm not going to show this right now, um, and maybe real quick this this question here: Can you put multiple values in the tooltip? And this actually this is a good good one to uh, kind of combine with this because it's the same mechanism. So this one doesn't have a tooltip right now. Mouse over, nothing happens. But if I give it a title, and I'm going to put this on a new line here just for readability, and I say this is the name. Uh, as a mouse over, it shows a name. But again, this is a column name. So I can just go in here and make a new function using my arrow notation and say, let's take the name plus 
um, I'll just I'll just use the weight here. Or actually, no, that's no. What else do we have cylinders? We'll put a a comma in between here. There are, there are better ways to do this, but <laughs> so now when I when I mouse over here, you can see that it shows me the 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 value the the, the name and then comma the cylinders. And and you can make this much better, of course. But this is just a simple way of doing this. You could use a format string. JavaScript has some really nice formatting format strings now that work really well uh, for this as well. So you can you can you can absolutely do that. All right. So this at this point we are at time. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for the questions. Uh, you asked me a lot more questions than I thought I was going to get. So I I didn't quite get through everything I wanted to. But please check out the write up which we've linked in the. Uh, in the description, and we're also sending this out as an email again. And uh, join us again next week. And next week, you'll you'll get some more details also on the assignment because questions people have asked about that. And uh, and we'll talk more about presentation, and we'll talk about uh, transformations of data uh, as well. So see you all next week. Thank you.